Uh, so first of all, mm -hmm. yeah, first of all, I'd like to thank Hong for the invitation. Yeah, I had, uh, I was lucky to have Hong as postdoc and then as colleague for about six years. Yeah, it's pity that Warwick lost him, but I hope we'll continue to work together. Yeah, and his group looks uh, really good. So today I'm going to talk about a topic where you have like combinatorics and randomness uh, come together. And this is joint work with Enrei Choka, Lukas Grabowski, Andra Schmate, and Posta Tirus. So just as a quick overview, so I'll quickly tell a statement of Lovos Lokalema, then describe what is most retarded algorithm, and then pre uh, present a version where basically uh, it algorithm relies on some random bits. So we don't throw them away, but we try to recycle them. So yeah, we help the planet by recycling random bits. Yeah, and then like perhaps I'll give a sketch of proof. So uh, to start with local lemma, so I gave this talk, I prepared the slides first for computer science audience. So my uh, local lemma is as a constraint satisfaction problem. So imagine you have n variables, each assumes some value between zero and uh, b minus one. Like b equal two is already interesting when uh, variables are binary. If you want to think about this probabilistically, then view them as independent random variable, each one uniform. Yes, yeah, so, and we collect them into the set, which we called var. So it's not variance, it's a set of variables. Yeah, then we have some number k. And by a clause, I mean, uh, you have, it takes some k of the variables. And then uh, kind of you have a function which look at, looks at the values and then produces true or false or zero and one. So each clause. And uh, if I have a clause C, its support will be uh, the variable it depends on. So it's some set of size K. And basically what our aim as input, we are given a family of clauses. And then we want to find assignment that satisfies every clause CI. So that's the setting. And local lemma is a very powerful tool, which uh, proves uh, that in some cases you can do it. Yeah, and uh, to state it for completeness, uh, given these clauses, we define dependency graph. So basically you connect two clauses if they share at least one variable. So it's a vertex set of clauses and edges to clauses which uh, share a variable. And then everywhere in this talk, let delta be the maximum degree in this graph. And again, I'll work with symmetric version. So I assume I have some uh, real P such that probability that some clause fails or bad events uh, in standard uh, extreme combinatorics point of view that each bad probability is bounded by this uh, constant P. Yeah, and then uh, lowest local lemma uh, says if some uh, P is sufficiently small, so here's like the sharpest version, then uh, it's possible. And yeah, and this is best possible as shear showed. And, but maybe you've seen like more convenient version to apply. Well, basically a weaker version is uh, like if Delta times P is smaller than one, smaller than one over E. And somehow one way to think about this, like uh, Delta plus one times P, it's like expected number of clauses, which could be bad around you. So each probability is P and you see it more as Delta plus one. So if locally first moment works with some uh, constant factor E margin, then basically you can find a global satisfying assignment. So that's the local lemma. Uh, are there any questions? Yeah, please feel, to in, uh, feel free to interrupt and ask questions. And uh, in the very same paper, uh, Erdős and Lovas, they gave one of the very first applications of the local lemma, which says the following, you give me any epsilon, and then I give you a zero. So if I take any finite set S, subset of integers, or Z to D or Z to one, then I can color integers uh, with uh, two colors, such that every translate of S has about the same number of each color. So if I look at, uh, so if I look at number of say vertices of color zero, 
it's about one half of total number with an epsilon. Mm -hmm. And so basically you, you want uh, to conclude that every translate of S is almost uh, color balanced. Yeah, and the proof again, it's of easy application. So for each translate, you introduce a constraint, which just depends on the colors on this copy of translate, which says it's balanced. And then Chernov bound shows that this P, this probability of failure is exponentially small in S. But on the other hand, if you ask about maximum degree in the dependency graph, well, if you have one copy of S, how many other translates would intersect it? Well, you just have to pick two vertices in the copy of S and make them coincide. So you have at most S square translates. So maximum degree is at most S square. Yeah, and then basically it's much smaller than uh, this S square times P is much smaller than one for large S. Yeah, so a local lemma applies and show that, uh, shows that every finite subset of the D can be colored. Yeah, and then by easy compactness argument, you can show that uh, whole space can be colored. So that's a typical uh, easy application of the local lemma. And then uh, like if you look at the event we're trying to find, in typical applications, it will be exponentially small in N. So it's a priori not clear if you can, one can find it efficiently. Yeah, and there are some number of partial results. Maybe first breakthrough was by back, and then Alan improved it a bit, and there are many other results. And then, but in these results, conditions on P was much uh, stronger. And kind of, and Moser, and then Moser Tardosh, uh, they gave condition on P, which is essentially best possible. And that they presented efficient randomized algorithm. And this opened a floodgate. Yeah, after this, there are lots of tons of results. Often for a specific problem, you have to look at the proof and then modify it and prove what you want. Mm -hmm. So let me state what's a Moser Tardosh algorithm and because uh, we need it for the talk. Okay, so we, if you remember, we have variables x1, xn, and so each variable generates a random sequence. So it's some kind of pre-processing. So each variable uh, flips a coin countably many times and writes in advance its sequence. So a sequence of xi is called R&D of i. So it's the random sequence that vertex uh, or variable xi will be using. And initially, uh, each vertex picks the first uh, bit. So I'll call elements of the sequence bits. And then the algorithm actually is very simple. Uh, so as long as you have some bad clauses which are not satisfied, you pick a maximal family of pairwise disjoint clauses. So maximal independent set in this dependency graph induced by bad clauses. And then you resample every clause. So for every variables in the clause C, uh, it uh, looks at its sequence of random bits and it picks next one and it changes its value. And this is done for every variable in the selected clause. And then Moser Tardosh proved uh, if you have say some gap, uh, one minus epsilon in this condition, then a number of resamples of any one variables is constant. And in particular, if you just run uh, this algorithm with all this uh, R and DI being independent and uniform, then expected running time would be just a linear in the number of variables. So you have like very efficient randomized algorithm and you can prove parallel version of it easily. Mm -hmm. And here maybe is a two example, just if you, this is the first time you see it, so suppose clause CI says that these three variables, XI, I plus one, I plus two are the same. So basically bad event, if you imagine variables are on the line and the bad event says consecutive triple is monochromatic. So here, what is probability of failure? <clears throat> well, you can pick first one anyway, and then the other two have to be the same color. So it's one will be square. A maximum degree is four. So like you can check if B is at least four, uh, lemma, local lemma applies. Of course, it's a baby example. It's very easy to find even for B equal to, uh, so it's fine assignment. Uh, 
But maybe let's look how the algorithm would uh, proceed here. So here are sequences. So for example, X1 uh, has sequence going this way, uh, like one, one, zero, zero, and so on. So what does algorithm do? First, it uh, looks at the first uh, element of each sequence. And so my first assignment is going to be one, 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 zero. And here there are like two bad events, uh, two monochromatic triples. And we have to pick a maximal independent set and say, suppose we pick the second one, this one. So the other, the ones which are not picked remain their values. And the variables in the picked uh, uh, set, they choose the next value in the table. So they each go up. And here next value happens to be zero, zero, zero in three cases. Again, it's still not satisfied. Like we have again, two bad events. And suppose we pick this one. Then again, uh, so the other bits uh, are the same. And then for these three, I have to go for next unused values. So this will be these three values. So they get values zero, zero, one. Okay, we're still out of luck, but we have only one bad event. And for these three, I have to pick uh, the three values. So this will be this pancake. So it's, uh, okay, I copy the other two and I have one, zero, one. And here my algorithm stops because we found this fine assignment. And now, uh, just for analysis, since we've used this idea, uh, once you run this algorithm, you can record some partial information. So in this particular case, uh, the information you would record is which clauses you resample. So for example, in this run, first we resample C2. So I'll draw this picture on the top. Then in next round, we resample C3. And then we resampled C2 again. Yeah, and then we stopped. Mm -hmm. So now uh, let's see if I can erase it here. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, suppose I give you just this information, namely, uh, so actually, in, in addition to closed, which you resample, you can make some kind of dependency graph. So uh, C3 was a bad close because while well, it uses some value from c2 here and so on so you have and you can uh, so you generate this forest where basically for every clause you pick one of the previous level where resampled one where you share the variable and now if i tell you this tree in fact you can uh, see actually where the bits for each clause come up okay the c2 is the like lowermost one so it's bit from this C3 up from here, C2. Now, if you look at C3, uh, there are nothing else below uh, except C2. So bits for C3 has to be this three. There is no other choice. And now maybe using green. So now you have like another uh, instance of C2. And below it, you see only C3 and C2. So actually, yeah, it has to be in these three bits. <clears throat> so somehow, if I give you this particular tree forest <clears throat> and ask uh, what is probability to see this forest given random, uh, say, zero, one bits, uh, here you can easily say that its probability is at most p cube, because knowing the forest, you can identify uh, for each clause where its bit come from. And then uh, we know that for each clause, probability of it's occurring is p. And here we talk about disjoint sets of bits. So probability is a p cube at most. Mm -hmm. And that's like this magic of uh, most retarded algorithm. Somehow, regardless of what choices you made uh, when you chosen this maximal independent sets, you can always up a bound probability of seeing some forest by just p to number of vertices. So maybe let me pause for a second in case there are some questions. So this is all standard. Okay. 
okay. Mm -hmm. And so we came into this area uh, about six years ago because we were thinking about proving a measurable version of local lemma. And in this version, your graph is not only infinite, it's uncountable. And its vertex set could be interval or real line. Mm -hmm. And then uh, somehow aim would be for every uh, element, every vertex, you want to define some value between zero and B minus one. And then this assignment as a function on reals, you want to be uh, definable. For example, the back measurable over L. Yeah, and uh, Gabor Kuhn and Anton Berstein, they prove some measurable versions. And with uh, the same authors, we were able to prove Borel versions. But unfortunately, yeah, it, uh, so our version, it applies only to graphs, which grow slowly. So if you take a vertex and see how its uh, neighborhoods grow, depending on the radius, then it's smaller than exponential. And one application we could uh, find was that if you remember, we had this result of Erdős and Lovas when you colored Z to D with two colors and you want every copy of S to be balanced. So basically one applications of our lemma is that on the same assumption with exactly the same function as zero of epsilon, we can find this coloring for RD, but we can make it Borel. So that was one of the kind of consequences. But at the time, yeah, we couldn't find any other applications so actually we didn't submit it to a journal, so it was lying on the archive. But more recently, Anton Bernstein, uh, he used it to prove this uh, nice result. So in computer science, they have this uh, local model computation, which was introduced by uh, Nati Lineal. So basically you have say bounded degree graph, and uh, in this model, each vertex uh, has unique ID, some binary uh, sequence. Uh, and additionally, you can look at some distance R, you see uh, isomorphism type, and you see IDs of all these vertices around your R neighborhood. And then you have to make a decision. Like for example, what is my color, red or blue? Mm -hmm. And Anton proved that if you have some class of problems, and if you uh, can, uh, in this local model, you can uh, solve them deterministically when you have to look only at radius uh, at most uh, constant log n on other n graphs, then uh, for Borel version, you can always find Borel solutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the proof here is basically, uh, okay, maybe I'll skip it, but there are some reductions not difficult but it applies only to exponential growth graphs and then he has to use, uh, he uses our Borel lemma. So somehow, yeah, we were very happy to see this application. And so recently we rewrote the paper and put it on archive. Since it's of interest to computer science, yeah, we rewrote it for finite graphs and then like added Borel part only at the very end. So maybe I'll just state this finite version so uh, as I said, so it's a version of most retarded algorithm, except we try to uh, recycle random bits. So how it goes. So here are the assumptions. Again, uh, we work the same, uh, uh, the same condition as in uh, lowest local lemma. Mm -hmm. And we assume that graph, our graph has sub exponential growth. And so basically whatever small app delta you give me, if I take radius sufficiently large, then every ball of radius R grows at most, uh, has at most one plus delta to R vertices. So on an exponential scale, growth is one plus a little of one. It's, it's uniformly. So, so here, mm -hmm. in, independent of vertex, this upper bound holds. So that's sub exponential growth. And then in the, uh, let's uh, fix large R which basically would depend on this epsilon and other parameters. And then let's fix some R sparse coloring. So R sparse, it means if I take any two distinct vertices, if they receive the same color, they have to be more than R apart. So uh, I never uh, see two vertices of the same color, different uh, distance at most R away. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and here okay i talk about distance between vertices so basically you can say two vertices are adjacent if they're in the same clause and then you can define distance uh, uh, property mm -hmm. so you have this uh, some coloring c and greedy algorithm says you can use some finite number of colors so let's put it delta to r for definiteness so you fix one such coloring c and then uh, you say the following so you you fix some color i and you look at all the vertices which have the same color i yeah and these vertices uh, they have to use uh, the same sequence so they all kind of make countably many uh, coin uh, tosses but they all have to use the same sequence so in some sense you, you allow two vertices which are far away and they use the same randomness mm -hmm. and under these assumptions so what we proved is here's like the main technical result so under sub exponential growth so uh, if you take m sufficiently large and then you look at event there are no that quantifier comes here before uh, inside probability Prob uh, the event that uh, at least one vertex xi is resampled at least m times is very small it's exponentially small in m and maybe some consequences so first you get this uh, version of moser targosh that if you fix any variable the expected number of resamples is constant but in fact uh, from the statement you get, you get a much stronger statement so for example you can derive uh, that you can choose some uh, sequence of random bits such that for every vertex uh, every vertex has to look at most m times before you find the assignment so if you choose m sufficiently large and uh, and this m does not depend on number of vertices it depends only on these parameters then you can find some uh, table where each vertex looks only at most m values before uh, satisfying assignment is found yeah and then one consequence of the last claim is if you have some exponential growth input you guarantee to have such inputs then you can write the deterministic algorithm whose running time is constant times n so if you remember moser tardos is a randomized algorithm with this running time yes yeah, so that's the main result which i want to uh, prove and kind of main part is this technical which implies all the other claims And before I give the proof, let me give you some toy example, maybe to see uh, why, why improvement comes from. So suppose you have just disjoint clauses. So every vertex is in most one clause. So if you run the usual moser tardos algorithm, what happens? Well, in each round, every clause uh, stays bad with probability p. So each round you reduce number of bad clauses by factor around p. So assuming p is constant, then you would need a log n round before you stop. Uh, let's see if you can do it a bit more clever. So suppose uh, what we do, we fix a proper coloring. So if you remember, we don't want uh, vertices which are close to each other have the same color. But here, like our graph just consists of clicks of size k. So we can uh, fix uh, coloring with only k colors. So in, in each clause, you have uh, k different vertices. They see k different colors. And then suppose if you look at my uh, random bits, so maybe we can write it as a table. So here are xi's. Then, okay. Mm -hmm. So here x1, uh, xn. Then if you look at uh, these rows, so basically we have only k possible values, so maybe first k1s. Because the rest are just some repetition of this. And here it's enough to say the following. If every possible sequence appears as a row, then my algorithm is guaranteed to stop. 
because you take any clause, well, uh, it has some positive probability of success. So there exists some assignment which works. And then when you, uh, when you resample using this new version, so basically all the vertices, they just change uh, synchronously their values. And so if you have, if you see every possible sequence of length k, then you are guaranteed to satisfy the clause. So somehow by recycling randomly, uh, you kind of reduce number of rounds from a log n to constant. Of course, it's very easy uh, baby example, but it kind of illustrates idea where improvement comes from. So now I'll try to give some sketch of proof. So what, uh, so first we have some constants. If you remember, okay, we have DNP that, and then also epsilon was roughly uh, gap in the uh, local lemma condition. And then you choose some delta, which needed for some calculations. And then given delta, you choose R, which would come from this growth property that both of radius R uh, uh, grow quite slow. Mm -hmm. And then given uh, R, you choose a uh, huge M, like double exponential in R, mm -hmm. or larger. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so we run our algorithm and let's for each variable, see how many times we resample. So we run it and at any moment we stop and see how often each variable is resampled. And we would like to show like it's very unlikely to reach for some variable to reach uh, M resamples. So let us stop for the first time when it happens. And then at the end, we want to show that this is very unlikely. Exponentially small in M. So again, G of X is the number of times that I resampled a variable. Okay, so pick one. So we stop at this moment. So we have some current state. And let's look at the variable called it X prime, which uh, was resampled most of times. And now uh, we do the following. So starting with uh, X prime, I just draw consecutive balls around it of large and larger radio. And for each ball of radius T, uh, G of T is the total weight I see inside. So it's, it's the same as total number of uh, resamples of variables inside this region. So particular like G of zero is M, the number of times I resample the center. And here, like when we use sub exponential growth, it's like a standard uh, argument. Uh, so we want to show that there exists some moment which happens before uh, R over two, that if when I increase my radius by one from T minus one to T, then I add only like delta fraction of extra uh, clauses, extra resamples with respect to this weight, which is resampling weight. Yeah, and prove basically if it's not true, okay, then for every T, I know that my bound, I, whenever I look at weight, each time I grow by factor one plus delta. So if I do it at least R over two times, I would get a factor improvement one plus delta uh, to power R over two compared with the initial one. So it's my total weight would be uh, at least this. But on the other hand, uh, M was the maximum possible in the whole graph, number of times that a variable was resampled. So if my total weight is this, and each variable is resampled at most M times, I must have at least so many uh, variables. So it means inside this uh, ball, I see tons of uh, uh, vertices, and that contradicts the choice of R, because R is chosen much larger depending on delta. So that's actually the crucial part where we use some exponential growth. Yeah, in the paper, we have to be a bit more technical, but kind of main idea is captured by this little claim.
So maybe uh, let's uh, continue. So let's recall what happens. We chose some constants. Then we run algorithm for some time and we stopped. And what we found, we found some ball B of radius uh, T, not very large, at most R over two. And uh, if capital M denotes the number of resamples, then uh, inside this ball, we have at least M resamples for sure, because just center of the ball was resampled M times. But at the same time, we know that if I look uh, uh, at resamples of boundary clauses, yeah, I have at most this number. Yeah, I probably here I change from variables to clauses. Yeah, maybe to be more precisely, yeah, since each clause has k variables, I need to put a k here to be on safe side. Mm -hmm. But kind of, but since all is uniformly bounded, yeah, I can switch between clauses and variables. Mm -hmm. And now, uh, so let's see what happens. So let me draw a picture. So here is my uh, X prime. I went out some radius T and somehow I only see, suppose my window is just this ball of radius T. So maybe I run most retargos. In the first step, I resample these two. Then in the second step, I just only have one clause which I resample. And then things stop locally, but of course it may continue. You might have something happening outside and maybe after a million of rounds, suddenly something appears from the boundary and then it causes some changes inside uh, your set. Mm -hmm. So a picture could look like this. And here, usual, usual analysis doesn't apply because in some sense, if you look at this component, say a bit here, it could be at the same bit as somewhere far away, which influenced through this chain uh, the other bits. So in some sense, now different components of your forest are not independent of each other. So they can recycle the same bits. So you cannot uh, apply usual Moser-Tardosh. But in some sense, uh, suppose uh, I just tell you picture uh, inside this uh, ball. So I'll tell you all clauses which are inside. And then also I'll tell you this little partial clause that was resampled. Now, if you know this picture and if you look at this table, again, some number, each column is number of zero, one bits, then actually you'll still be able to put these clauses. So like this one, you know, is the most one. Then next one, say this one would be somewhere here. And maybe let me just draw, uh, suppose you look this one, it shows a bit. So somehow you'll, you'll know where the green bits come from. So perhaps this boundary close was this. And then green one would be something like this. Mm -hmm. So somehow uh, point, main kind of idea is you have this local picture. You don't know what happens outside. But if you have it, you still can, for each clause in your local picture, you can tell exactly where these bits come from, uh, from this uh, random table. And like in this picture, uh, I have I happen to have uh, six clauses inside, uh, entirely inside uh, this ball. So here I can conclude that probability of seeing uh, such a picture is at most P to six, by the very same uh, Mozart Targosh magic. So if I tell you picture inside, then its probability is at most p to, to power number of clauses entirely inside this ball. Uh, and the reason is because uh, this diameter is at most r. So all these sequences, are, all these bits are different. So all these events are independent. So if I tell you, uh, this random bits and these three random bits, they're independent of each other. Mm -hmm. And now the rest, you, uh, here's another twist. Okay, so if you look at this ball, 
it, it could happen here, it could happen in some other part of the graph and so on. But uh, well, we know it has diameter at most R. So it has at most uh, delta uh, to two R possible vertices. And then inside here, like number of possible graphs and number how your constraints here are laid out is just only some function depend on R. So this would be some double exponential function, but who cares? Just some function that depends on R. So this is number up to isomorphism, how you can, uh, what graph and what clauses you see in this, inside this uh, window. And now we need another part of mother tardus proof with some modification. So basically uh, we can ask, okay, but how many pictures we see? So for each tree, you know, it's probability uh, of seeing it. So if you remember, we had an example like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in this example, uh, so uh, of course, uh, you don't know how much time passed when something happens on the boundary, but you can always uh, kind of compress this picture, we call it grounded. So whenever you see such pictures, you can move it down. And uh, when you still have forest and each element has the, uh, exactly one neighbor below it. Mm -hmm. yeah, and then, uh, and some of them are maybe cut by boundary. But in total, you know, number of uh, clauses which you see would be at most one plus delta times M. And then some counting shows the total number of such pictures. Once you introduce some equivalence relations, when you basically can push them down as much as you can, and then total number of such pictures is, ex is at most this one. So it's a very similar calculation, which you see in Moser or moser tardosh paper. And now basically we are ready to put all parts together. So somehow you just say, what is the probability of this happening? Just apply union bound. Uh, inside this ball, I see so many possible pictures. Then I have so many possible uh, Moser Tardos trees, but each one is at most so likely. Yeah, and this is exponentially small in M. Yeah, and that like, finishes the proof outline. So somehow, yeah, one idea is that if you, you have some window and if you have some uh, clauses entirely inside the window, they're independent. And they use independent sets of variables as independent as in Moser Tardos. And another idea is if somehow you know that uh, among your samples, you have very few boundary clauses, yeah, then uh, you pay this extra multiplicative uh, whatever in the exponent or additive in the exponent delta M, but delta was much smaller than your epsilon, so by, uh, you're still fine. So that's very roughly the idea. So maybe let me just finish with some concluding remarks and open questions. So one question you can ask, well, can we, this notion, this assumption that the graph is sub-exponential, is it really needed or not? And the answer is yes, it's needed. Uh, so if you remember here was our conclusion, let me call it a star. So I can find some choice of random bits such that every variable is resampled a constant number of times at most. Yeah, and then uh, there was nice uh, big result by Andrew Marx in descriptive combinatorics. So he produced a Borel uh, deregular graph. So maybe I'll draw the picture here, say it's three regular. This graph comes with edge coloring. So among each vertex, I see all three colors. And now your aim is to put some colors on vertices. So maybe again, the same number of colors. But what is the bad event? You are not allowed to put, uh, if you see edge of color I, at least one of endpoints should have color different from I. So this is an example of bad event. Yeah, and he proved it that in this Borel world, you cannot solve this problem. So in his example, there is no Borel assignment that avoids all such uh, bad events. And maybe uh, just very briefly, oops. 
No, I'm not sure if you can see. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and basically, yeah, it implies that you cannot uh, have this condition because yeah, it implies moral conditions. And interesting, yeah, he uses some deep result in descriptive set theory, like uh, Martin's determinacy theorem. And uh, we are not aware of some combinatorial argument that shows that you cannot satisfy this. So argument of Andrew Marx was adopted to kind of finite graphs by this group, by Sebastian Brandt et al. And they proved basically that his technique shows there exists no local algorithm which uses orbital of Olegan rounds, but this is weaker. So Bernstein uh, uh, correspondent says, uh, kind of having no Borel solution is stronger than having no such algorithm. And maybe like two open questions which I want to draw your attention. So one is, I'm not sure if it's related. So uh, one is this question of Chang and Petty which is central question about this deterministic algorithm. If you can find a local algorithm, deterministic, which uses radius constant times log n for general local lemma. So the best one is for some version roughly polylog of this, log to six. And another one, it'd be nice to, yeah, if you can find some applications of local lemma, so let me thank you for your attention and wish happy birthday and very productive uh, happy years to the new group. Thank you. Yeah, feel free to unmute yourself to ask questions. We have a couple of minutes for questions. So maybe I will start with a question, not really a technical question. So this idea of reusing the random bits for the vertices that are quite far apart, then uh, it seems quite, it seems that this idea can be applied to any kind of local algorithm when far apart vertices have no interaction. Right? And if, if the algorithm initially was using random bits, you can always yeah, use mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good observation. In some sense, it was used by Bernstein. And maybe related to this open question, uh, like uh, in this example, we can prove that it's impossible that some vertex is resampled many times. Okay, we can rule this out. But in our proof, we cannot rule out an example when you maybe have a linear chain, which goes like constant n even like times. And then in this case, no, it's not a local algorithm because whatever value at this point is somehow may depend whatever whatever happened here. And somehow these long chains we cannot rule out. In most retardos, uh, if, if all bits are completely random, they can show it's at most logarithmic in an such chain. But in our proof, uh, yeah, we don't know even how to rule out linear time, linear long chain. Or maybe in the proof it's polylogarithmic. Yeah, I need to check. Anyone have other questions? So we are almost close to the <laughs> next talk time. So maybe let's think. All the questions we can ask later. Yeah.